Okay, well, a warm welcome to all of you to the 2022 CHSB Spring Seminar. My name is Caroline Kingori, and I'm the Interim Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Affairs, as well as an Associate Professor in Department of Social and Public Health. The CHSP Spring Seminar is part of the Grover Lecture Series. It was first endowed in 1999 and was established by Anne Grover and her late husband, Brandon T. Grover Jr. to bring nationally recognized speakers to campus to address health-related issues. The series celebrates the history of Grover Center by bringing in a speaker that is of interest to all disciplines. I'm so excited to introduce our speaker today. That's Dr. Sandro Galea, who's the Dean and Robert A. Knox Professor of the School of Public Health at Boston University. He will talk to us about how we can rethink our approach to health after the pandemic and the lessons learned from COVID-19. Dr. Galea is a physician, social epidemiologist, prolific author, widely cited scholar, and was named one of Time Magazine's epidemiology innovators, and has also been listed as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. A native of Malta, he has served as field physician for Doctors Without Borders, and has held academic positions at Columbia University, University of Michigan, and the New York Academy of Medicine. He's also a past chair of both of the associations of schools of programs of public health, a past president of the Society for Epidemiological Research, as well as a member of the National Academy of Medicine. He's well published in numerous peer-reviewed literature and regular contributor to a range of public media about the social causes of health, mental health, and the consequences of trauma. If you want to find out more information about him, you can visit his website, sandragalea.org. So today he will talk more about the pandemic um, and how we're approaching the end of it and the impact it has caused to us and how we can engage in new ways of thinking and doing. COVID-19 is a moment for public health to take stock, a moment to ask ourselves, who are we? What are we doing and why? And he submits a forward thinking, forward looking public health approach that we should aspire um, that looks at a radical vision of a better, healthier world for all. We should have the wisdom to achieve that world through gradual reform guided by reason. So he'll talk about the implications and what we need to do from here. Welcome, Dr. Galea. Glad to have you. Thank you, Dr. Kikori. It's Thank you so much for having me. I'm only sorry we're not there in person, but um, thank you for having me here. It's really an honor to be here with you. And thank you for the very kind words of introduction. So let me share my screen. Can you let me know? Do you see that okay? Excellent. Very good. So um, I'm going to um, dive right in and uh, I will start off by saying that uh, I do not know if the pandemic is over in, uh, in, in the US, but I do know that uh, we are at a moment of relative calm, perhaps in between variants, but uh, hopefully not, a, not uh, expecting another severe variant. But be that as it may, I certainly don't think it's too soon to start thinking about what we can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic. So what I'm trying to do in my talk is to give us a frame how to think about COVID-19 and how to think about COVID-19 and what we extract from it and what we can learn about health. Everybody here has been immersed in COVID-19 for the past two years. So I think um, we all have a lot of these details sort of rummaging around in our head um, uh, over the past two years. But my, my goal here is to help us organize our thinking and to say, what is it that um, we uh, can learn from COVID-19? So with that having said that, let me um, move on. So let me talk about the pandemic, first of all. So the COVID-19 pandemic is um, certainly has been the sentinel pandemic of our lifetimes. Everybody here in this room, we haven't lived through a pandemic this big, but it's important to remember that this is part of a long line of pandemics in the world. This is a picture from uh, the uh, Middle Ages in, uh, in Europe where the uh, Black Plague killed about a third of all people in Europe at the time. And um, I, um, I find this um, picture amusing. This is um, what uh, doctors used to wear at the time of the Black Plague, which uh, as they, or visiting patients, and of course uh, I show this because of the um, similarities between the uh, mask, the bird-like mask that uh, doctors were wearing then, 
and the masks that we wore during this pandemic. This is 700 years later, um, some things have been changed. But I think I say this importantly to point out that there will be other pandemics. Now, hopefully not in our lifetimes, but there will be other ones and there may well be other ones in our lifetime, which means that learning from this pandemic and thinking about how this pandemic can um, point us in a direction of um, what we need to do better to prevent the next one is critical at this point. You know, we sort of did know this. I mean, when uh, the pandemic hit the um, La Peste or uh, the plague by Albert Camus um, became a top seller soon as the pandemic, as we all looked to uh, read and uh, to understand what had happened in previous pandemics. And, you know, COVID pandemic has been with us in many different forms. This looks at the uh, daily trends and number of COVID cases in the context of, um, um, as reported to CDC. And you see, this was like pretty slides about 10 days ago. That's where we are today. And this, these are the trends in number of deaths as uh, they've also been going up and down during the pandemic. But perhaps most evocatively as to what's happened in the pandemic is this slide. This slide is um, a snapshot of one point in time in uh, 2020 from the New York Times. And the reason I show the slides is because the uh, paper shows the color red, the greater the density to indicate the uh, more um, cases of uh, disease and uh, you um, and and uh, I think everybody here realizes that uh, if you were an alien coming to this planet, if you didn't know what this was, you would notice nothing good. It looks like the whole country is on fire. And uh, I think it's fair to say that the whole country has felt like it's been on fire. And, you know, I, I as I talk about the deaths from COVID, I think there is a danger and uh, that um, when one talks about deaths and deaths in population and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of deaths, of depersonalizing the consequences of COVID. But it's important to remember that uh, these deaths are people. These deaths are people. They are fathers, mothers, children, grandparents, cousins, aunts, lovers, friends, you know, and, uh, and it's important to remember that the nearly 1 million people who have died from COVID are people who were walking among, among us and who died uh, in the context of COVID. And that, and that is a tragedy that is um, that really we should never forget. And I think it is part by in part honoring the tragedy that we should be thinking about what we should be learning from COVID-19. And uh, the um, the other part of COVID-19 that has been remarkable is, uh, this is uh, from a, a um, Guayaquil city in uh, Peru, where there's been uh, a um, substantial outbreak of COVID. And uh, Restaban Ortiz, who's a physician, says there's one day there were no patients. Uh, the next there were 5,000 looking for beds in intensive care units which is actually really quite amazing when you think about it. Now, I will point out that this talk is very domestically focused. It focuses on the US. One could do a global talk, like one should do a global talk. Um, uh, but I will here focus um, uh, domestically, even though recognizing that the pandemic has uh, killed another 5 million people outside of the million in the US and the rest of the country. And, you know, we have been dealing with a, um, a whole range of the consequences of uh, um, uh, the pandemic. And I, I did want to just uh, show you this slide. This looks uh, at, for example, things like overdose deaths. I'll come back to this later that have also been soaring in a time of pandemic. But I also have here on this um, slide a picture from uh, the New York Times in May of 2020. And um, the reason I'm showing this is because um, you see here in all caps and uh, sort of bold all over the uh, um, 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 the Times banner saying 100,000 deaths and incalculable loss. And I agree completely that 100,000 deaths were an incalculable loss, but just to point out that we're now approaching a million deaths. That really is uh, quite remarkable if you think about it in terms of the burden of this. So in the spirit of organizing our thoughts, let me start with what did not go well during COVID-19. You know, everything I've given you so far has been impressionistic. It's, a, it's been a terrible moment. We feel it viscerally. People who we know may have died. It's, been, it's all terrible. But let, let's organize our thinking and say, what did not go well during COVID-19? And I, I would argue there are three things that did not go well. Number one, the overall burden. Number two is inequities and burden. And number three, social fracturing. So let me talk about each of those. Let's start with the overall burden. Now, the overall burden I've already been talking about, but I think it's important to look at how badly we did as a country and really how much worse we did than compared to other peer countries. The red line here is the US and Canada, and the different colors are different regions, and these are cases per population. And what you see is in, in every wave of the pandemic, we've actually done worse than other countries in cases per population. When you compare us to other high-income countries in terms of our cumulative deaths during the pandemic, you see that, uh, again, per, per case in population, we passed all other high income countries in terms of number of deaths throughout the pandemic and particularly cumulative deaths during Omicron, we uh, substantially have passed other countries. In fact, when you look at the, um, this is 2020, the leading causes of death in 2020, the, um, you see that COVID was the third leading cause of death in 2020. That's the third line from the top after heart disease and cancer. Now, it's hard to remember that in December of 2019, December 31st, 2019, 
nobody had heard the term COVID. Now, if I were to tell you that they say in 2023, there's going to be a, let's say 2025, just give it a couple of years off. There's going to be a new disease that you've never heard of right now that is, that is called with some combination of letters that you haven't heard of them go together. And that's going to become the third leading cause of that, 2023. Like you have heart disease, cancer, and something else, X, Z, Y, L, some disease. You're going to say, wow, how do I prevent X, Z, Y, L? How do I make sure it doesn't actually affect us? It really sends a bit of a chill down one spine, right? But that's exactly what happened with COVID. And I think that's the magnitude of COVID that we cannot forget. And it has had an enormous impact on our life expectancy. This looks at life expectancy and she's tailing off of life expectancy with an aggregate loss in life expectancy, which I'll get to in a second. So overall, there's been a remarkable burden of COVID that has been worse in this country than in other comparable countries. Perhaps just, just as badly or perhaps worse has been the inequities in this burden, that COVID has not been experienced equally. It has not been experienced equally on any number of axes of advantage and disadvantage in this country. For example, we can start with race, just looking at um, this life expectancy, we have Latino, white, and black, just comparing the white and black for a second. You see that uh, life expectancy about um, um, uh, black Americans has taken a significantly bigger downturn than it has among white Americans. When you look at the comparison between um, um, uh, black and white Americans, and this is adjusted and unadjusted, if you just focus on the adjusted, which is the orange, you see that black Americans died at about twice the rate of this, as did white Americans. And when you look at life expectancy drop, this is life expectancy drop on the far right. You have white women who had life expectancy drop of 0.7. On the far left, you have the remarkable life expectancy drop of three years among black men. Now, I should comment about 0 0.7. 0 0.7 years of life expectancy drop is the biggest life expectancy drop that we've had since World War II. So 0.7 is already huge. We have had drops in life expectancy in the past 80 years, but they're typically in the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 range. Well, 0.7 is really quite enormous. Three is really unbelievable. It's a really unprecedented in 100 years since the 1918 flu pandemic itself. Now I'm showing you inequities by race, but I could show you inequities in uh, by all sorts of other dimensions. Just by way of example, this looks at um, inequity by educational attainment. And um, these are different rows of different age groups. You just focus on the bottom, focus on the bottom. These are people over age 65 and you look at um, COVID mortality and you have different racial groups. You see American Indian, Asian, Black, Latinx, Pacific Islander and white. But if you just look at in each of the groups, there's a downward slope from more edu uh, less education to more education. The more education you had, the less likely you are to have experienced death from COVID. So there's this tremendous um, uh, gradient, mortality and morbidity grade from COVID as determined by axes of advantage and disadvantage in this country, which means, of course, the virus was ex not experienced evenly at all. There's tremendously different experiences of the virus among different groups of people. And the third point is social fracturing. Now, political scientists will tell you that there's nothing more unifying than a common enemy. And we had a common enemy, the virus. You think it would be a time to bring us together as a country, but the opposite happened. First of all, the virus hit at a time of extreme civil unrest. It's a time when uh, we had had uh, um, civil unrest, large civil unrest about issues of sexism, issues of uh, uh, poverty, economic inequality, issues of racism, issues of climate change. And it's then no wonder that that coincided with COVID to create these, the largest civil unrest the country's ever seen. This legitimate um, outpouring of uh, civil unrest that followed principally the killing of unarmed black men and women, particularly George Floyd. And uh, that resulted more people um, were involved in, um, in civil protest than any time in the country's history, even more than 1968. That, of course, then triggered continued sort of a, a breakdown of social fracturing, including, of course, the attack on the Capitol in uh, January 6th. But that, well, that's a dramatic example, also accompanied by things like this, which is uh, protests about uh, closures of school. And even on smaller things, even on smaller things, for example, um, uh, you see things like this, like the world's been still arguing about face masks 20 months or two years into the pandemic. So it was a moment when, despite the fact that the pandemic could have brought us together, it didn't bring us together. Instead, it drove us apart. So I think these are the things that, that went wrong. Overall burden, inequities, and, so, and social fracturing. So now let's talk about, well, what caused these shortcomings? What actually resulted in these shortcomings? And I would like to offer three explanations for it. Number one is technical shortfalls, antecedent inequities, and communication challenges. So let me talk about each one. Let me start with technically. So technically, we made a lot of mistakes. We didn't get testing um, um, up and running quickly. We were incapable of doing testing and tracing and ways to contain the pandemic quickly. Perhaps one of our most amazing technical challenges actually came in response to um, the um, to what really was a technical success. It was a huge technical success that uh, we developed vaccines as quickly as we did. Eight months into uh, the pandemic, we had not one, but two vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, more than 90% effective in clinical trials. Things like J&J &J vaccine coming soon after showing themselves to be very effective. That is really remarkable. And it's a sign of a, um, 
coming to fruition of something we had invested in, which is mRNA technology that uh, resulted in these vaccines. But although that was a success, our technical challenge was then delivering the vaccines. We learned very quickly that um, developing vaccines is not the same as vaccinating people. And in fact, we have lagged behind substantially other large high income countries in vaccinating people. What you see is here on the left is the share of population fully vaccinated. On the right, the share of population with a booster dose. We as a country have um, not done that great. I mean, there's different ways of looking at it, of course. I mean, you can look at uh, this as a glass half full, glass half empty. I mean, when you look at uh, on the left, people with at least one dose. Well, over the age of 65, 95% plus of Americans have had at least one dose of disease, which I suppose you could consider a triumph, but it's not really a triumph when you realize that uh, across all ages, we have only 63% of people vaccinated. And of course, that the vaccines have been very unevenly distributed throughout the country. There's a map of the country. With the more green, you have more people who are vaccinated and you see large parts of the country where it's actually the prevalence of vaccination is quite low. And when you take the same scale and apply it to boosters, you actually see that we have had relatively few people who have actually been boosted. So we've had this technical challenge of getting vaccines to people despite our technical success of actually pro providing vaccines. And perhaps even worse, we've learned that we have been technically challenged in delivering the vaccines to people who need them the most. There's something in medicine called the inverse care law, which was determined by Julian Tudor Hart, which says that people who need care the, the uh, most are the ones who get it least. Unfortunately, that's been exactly the case with vaccines. What you see here is the bottom row are people who are living in least vulnerable counties, counties that are healthier, and the top row people who are in most vulnerable, most sick counties. And what you see is the average vaccination rate by county. And what you see is people living in most vulnerable counties are people who actually are less likely to get the vaccine, which is of course the exact opposite of what you'd want. So number one has been technical shortcomings. Number two has been inequities that existed before COVID and that COVID simply exploited, that COVID really took advantage of to, to result in even deeper inequities. Well, at one top level, the country has uh, tremendous inequities across multiple dimensions, across race, socioeconomic position, across over education. But for example, there's a 20 year gap in life expectancy between the counties with the lowest and highest life expectancy. Groups that have been historically marginalized and disadvantaged, like Black Americans, have uh, historically worse health on multiple indicators. For example, um, this looks at Black Americans versus White Americans, Black being the purple and White being the blue. And what you see is, um, this is over time, higher unemployment rate, fewer people going to a four-year college degree, lower median household income, lower home ownership rate, more incarceration rate, all of that's among Black Americans than White Americans. And then, of course, that translates into lower life expectancy at birth. But it's not just race, it's not just race, I'm gonna show it to you by socioeconomic position. This looks, for example, at angina and heart attack, two measures of heart, of a heart disease. And we see them over time. And the, the brown dots are the poorest 80% of Americans. The blue dots are the richest 20% of Americans. And what you see is that the richest 20% of Americans have been, and the, and the poorest 80%, which is 20% versus 80%, has been widening over time, over the past um, uh, couple of decades. And these underlying inequities became the inequities, they, they, they resulted in the inequities that we saw in COVID. How did these happen? How did these become inequities in COVID? Well, when COVID hit, our underlying inequities resulted in underlying dif in differences in our behaviors that determined whether we're likely to get COVID. For example, for example, in March of 13 to 2020, when there was the presidential emergency disaster declaration around COVID, what you see is that you had the people stay home, but the wealthiest, which is the gray line, stayed home much more than the least wealthy. In fact, when you look at the data from Bureau of Labor Statistics, what you see by income quartile, the higher the income is, the more likely you are to be able to work remotely. And only about 35% of Americans were able to work remotely at any point in time, which is really quite remarkable when you think about the most Americans were not able to work remotely, which means most Americans were uh, much more exposed to COVID than those who were able to work remotely. And of course, who were the Americans who were able to work remotely? Um, well, there were Americans who were richest Americans, those with the higher income, with the higher income quartile, and that maps on to race. Black workers, for example, much more likely to be frontline workers, much more likely um, uh, to be in public transit and grocery and trucking. And these are occupations that were more exposed to COVID, which resulted, resulted then in Black Americans being more exposed to COVID. And other forms of inequities that were underlying were the underlying poor health among people who are disadvantaged. So, for example, you look at income here and you look at the, the yellow bar, the yellow bar is having illness that makes you vulnerable to COVID. The um, more income you have, the more um, you're diagnosed with illness, um, the, the less illness you have to make you vulnerable to COVID. And uh, as a result, it means that people with more income were less likely to get bad COVID. And again, that overlaps with race. 
because here what you see is among black Americans versus white Americans, black Americans at younger ages, middle ages, older ages, were more likely to have high blood pressure and diabetes, making them more vulnerable to COVID. So it's underlying inequities that position us to have the inequities we saw in a time of COVID. The third cause is communication challenges, that actually we stumbled badly in communication. Now, a lot of this communication is ultimately traced to leadership. This is one of President Trump's uh, um, COVID briefing, and it is a nonpartisan comment to say that there were real challenges in um, communicating in a time of COVID. It is um, the COVID hit the country at a time when the incumbent president was gearing up to uh, contest an election. And uh, as a result, it became a real presidential election issue on both sides of the aisle at a time when the country has been increasingly divided. This looks at the divisions between Democrats and Republicans. And what you see is um, uh, the overlap of perspectives as it's separated more and more. And COVID really played directly into those fractures. And that challenged our communication at the federal level on multiple fronts. The CDC has taken its fair share of blame for uh, the uh, communication of COVID, but as I'm going to argue in a second, I actually don't think it's fair to blame CDC because I think CDC was actually working with the resources had available and we did not make resources available to CDC before COVID. But all of this resulted in us really mucking up communication, things like saying we don't need a mask, when in fact needed masks. And, for, and then of course, asking people to wear cloth masks for a year and now realizing that cloth masks probably made no difference whatsoever. So then the question becomes, okay, having recognized that these are the problems that caused the problems that we saw with COVID, what are the fundamental root causes of these problems? Because I think understanding the fundamental root causes results in us understanding what needs to be done in order to fix these problems. So let's talk about the fundamental root causes. I think there are three fundamental root causes, the investment or the underinvestment in systems, the investment or underinvestment in health, and the intersection of politics and science. So let's start with the third of each one. Let's start with underinvestment in systems. We have been for a long time under investing in the systems that could have helped us in time of COVID, which you see here is in terms of state and local public health. Um, um, uh, workforces have shrunk over the past 20 years. The, the uh, brown is local, the blue is state. You see how that has shrunk over the past uh, 40 years. Most public health agency staffing and spending has dropped. The top is uh, changing in staffing. The bottom is changing in expenditure. The more brown, it means there's a drop. And you see it's the case in most of the country. And most states spend less than $100 per person on public health. The more red, that means the less money. And you see most states spend less than $100 per person. And in fact, even though there have been some efforts to fund public health more, for example, the federal prevention funding, the black line is intended funding. The blue line is the actual funding which has happened, which frequently we underinvest despite our best intentions. Most local health departments don't have epidemiologists. In fact, only about a quarter of health departments have epidemiologists. And when you think about that, it's amazing that we actually even handle the pandemic at all. And uh, state and local governments typically spend about 3% on public health, which is really quite amazing to think about. So coming back to CDC, you know, the CDC um, been blamed for a lot of things, including, for example, the uh, failure on testing, but uh, this is from a piece on this. And if you look at the at the um, sub-lead, you see that uh, the testing that CDC was expected to do that was supposed to be an enormous part of our response to the pandemic fell on a lab which had only three employees. That's how much we had invested in as a um, as a country, which of course is not very much at all. And it's perhaps ironic or perhaps indicative of the um, um, social unrest we experienced during COVID. Actually, most local governments spend more on policing than they do on public health. Um, underinvestment in health. We spend a lot of money in health, actually. We don't underinvest in health. This is us. Um, um, the blue line is the US, and this is spending in health over time, which is the US spends much more over time than do um, other uh, high income countries. But we don't invest in health. What we really invest in is in healthcare, in medical care. When you look at um, this, which is looks at uh, um, over time, leaving aside social security, you see our blue, which is our increased spending in healthcare programs, and the gray, which is all other spending, which is going down over time. You take a state like Massachusetts, where I live in, which is considered to be reasonably enough, one of the most progressive states. What you have is um, over a 15 year period, you see to the right, you have a bar, 100% increase in healthcare spending, but same or decreased spending on things like transportation, housing, primary, secondary education, law enforcement, public safety, mental health, higher education, early childhood education, public health, environment and recreation, all of which fundamentally determines health because health is determined by our conditions, whether we live, our, uh, where we live, our housing, our parks, our recreation, whether we're lonely, whether we have money to feed our children. And all of this are things that we have under invested in over the course of the past several decades. And not just that, this underinvestment extends decades and centuries. It extends all the way to historical underinvestment and um, among particularly in 
in the well-being and in the conditions that create well-being among uh, marginalized groups. By way of illustration, I'll just talk about redlining for a second. There's a map of Detroit, and this map comes from 1930s from the Home Owners Loan Corporation. The Home Owners Loan Corporation was established by the federal government as an effort to uh, encourage lenders to um, lend money to um, homeowners so people can buy homes, so people can get mortgages. Well, of course, the way it worked is they would take maps of, of uh, cities like this one of Detroit, and they would take a pen, green pen, yellow pen, red pen, mark in green places where uh, the federal government would recommend bankers would lend money, and in red where they would recommend not to lend money. And of course, the red were areas where African-Americans lived. That resulted in African-Americans being systematically denied opportunities to buy homes and build wealth and continue to live in, in housing that's worse than housing that among white Americans have less wealth and to this day then being at greater risk for poor health. And actually, when you look at a map of Detroit looked in a different way, you see there's the sharp line between the red and the yellow. The sharp line is actually eight mile. And today, to this day, the green dots are uh, black Americans, the uh, blue dots are white Americans. You see this enormous racial segregation with black Americans, white Americans living in very different parts of Detroit. And those areas where black Americans live can remain concentrated areas where there's poorer health. So this actually the map on the left is the same map of redlining I showed you before, only now rendered in sort of fancy geographic imaging software. The map in the middle looks at neighborhood foreclosure rate in the 2008 economic recession. So many more houses were foreclosed on, the darker the color coinciding with the redlining map. And the map right looks at poor health and the darker car colors represent the poor health. Redlining 100 years ago, consequences of economic recession 20 year, 10 years ago, poor health today. So these are the things that we have underinvested in over time. And we as a country have um, fewer people who are vaccinated, more people who are obese, and many other dimensions, all of which intersected then with COVID to create poorer health. And the third root cause is politics, politics and science and how we did our science. And I think it's important to actually recognize both. I'll start with politics. This um, is, a, looks at, is a graph that looks at um, change in life expectancy and the proportion of people on the y-axis who voted for candidate Trump in the 2016 presidential election. If you go to the right, it means you live in a county which has been doing better in life expectancy. If you go to the left, it means you live in a county which is doing worse in life expectancy. And what you see is this very simple correlation that um, living in a county where um, you have your life expectancy is getting better, you're less likely to vote for candidate Trump. Conversely, if you're living in a county where your health is getting worse, you're more likely to vote for President Trump. I'll point out that uh, President Trump, uh, candidate Trump, ran as a candidate of disruption. And if your county that you're living in is a county that um, has a life expectancy doing worse, it's not at all unreasonable for you to actually want to vote for a candidate of disruption. It's actually, I think, to my mind, is a rational act. So the politics were already divided along the lines of health, with a large part of the country that was already had a burden of disease actually being favoring one particular candidate who at that time happened to be president, which then led to the divisions that I'm talking about earlier. These underlying roots also extend to our role in the science and our role for those of us who are in the academic media political space that made decisions around COVID. And just to show one concrete example of that, this looks at um, how people did on various dimensions during COVID, mental health, personal finances, job security, physical health, personal life, work-life balance. Above the line means things got better, below the line means things got worse. And what you see is that for everybody below the line, things got worse, except for this one group, group with postgraduate education, which is also the group with more than 100,000 um, uh, income a year. Well, that group are people who are in college, who are educated, who actually do the science. And that group then did quite differently in COVID than did the rest of the country. And that group also experienced things, for example, like school closures very differently because we know that schools in more affluent areas reopen faster. So you had a political scientific media complex that was largely determining decisions that were being made during COVID. And those decisions were being made by people who actually had a very different experience of COVID than did everybody else in the country. Other areas in which the science I think failed where the science actually developed a orthodoxy of perspective very quickly and did not allow for a divergence of perspectives. For example, the Great Barrington Declaration was a declaration that was signed by many leading scientists. And uh, it essentially came out in 2020 and said, what we should do in COVID is risk stratify, is protect the people who are high risk and not do lockdowns on, on everybody else. This was roundly denounced in the scientific community, including, for example, the Union of Concerned Scientists, who say herding people to slaughter, the dangerous fringe theory behind the Great Burning Declaration, essentially suggesting that the people who are um, proposing the Great Burning Declaration were, were killing people. And of course, it was a very reasonable way of of uh, thinking differently. And I think one of the things that we did wrongly in science and COVID was we had an intolerance of disagreement of perspectives. And then we also used that intolerance to 
deepen a particular view of the world, including, for example, the world that says we should actually be aiming for zero COVID, that the view of the world that says that the only thing that matters is COVID. And of course, it's easy for science and politics and media to say when everybody was working from home, very different if you're actually, your job depends on being a bus driver in transit or in retail. And that um, um, was, for example, trumpeted on the left in the Lancet, one of the leading medical journals, even, and now only China remains to be the only country that follows zero COVID. And it's been an enormous distraction for countries building on essentially a scientific orthodoxy that was simply wrong. So having said this, having identified what went wrong, having identified what caused to go wrong, how does this shape our approach to health? So this is broadly what I've been talking about. So if you go to the right, I talked about there's an overall burden, which was wrong, inequities and burden, social fracturing. That was driven by, you go to the middle, by technical shortfalls, underlying inequities and communication challenges. And that was driven by our underinvestment in systems and health and the politics and science. So what does that lead us to do? I think it leads us to do three things. It leads us to say we should focus more on health. We should have a better value informed science and we should surface and front the health conversation. So how do we do that? Let me talk about each of them. Let's start with a focus on health. What does it mean to focus on health? I think it means we transform how we think about health. And I think it means we learn from COVID-19 to inform other conditions. So how do we think about health? Well, we need to start thinking that um, health was already terrible in this country before COVID. Nothing to do with COVID. This is long before COVID. We were gaining on other countries in life expectancy until the mid 90s, and then we started losing on life expectancy compared to other countries. That is a national shame. It's a national shame. And I was talking about the fact it was a national shame before COVID, and it's been a national shame after COVID. And why is that? Well, it's because this is how we spend our time. We work, we sleep, we do leisure, we care for others, we do household, we do eat. We don't spend our time going to the doctor, but in fact, our spending is all about the doctor. This is what causes health. Healthcare and health it causes 10, 20% of our health, but most of our health is caused by tobacco use, diet, exercise, alcohol use, sex, houses we live in, education, job status, income, community safety, all of this is what causes health. And that is not how we see health. Remember I showed you earlier, the graph about the health spending, it's not really about health spending, it's really about healthcare spending. And we need to change how we think about health. This is from a piece I wrote in the US News and World Report in 2019, saying that we need a health new deal. Unfortunately, I feel like the same thing, exact same thing applies today. And then one other dimension about this, about a focus on health, is that we actually need to think about beyond COVID and think about a whole range of uh, disorders that are affected when we do something like um, uh, go through something like COVID. I've argued against what I called COVID exceptionalism. And uh, by noting, for example, that um, during COVID, a whole range of other disorders had, had more mortality, not just COVID. This looks in 2020. The blue line was the average in the preceding five years, but the bars were the deaths we had during COVID. We had higher deaths from stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, hypertension. All these other disorders went up during COVID. And I think a way of thinking about health correctly needs to embrace this full range of other disorders. Mental health became um, a rampant problem during COVID, particularly places like colleges. And what you see here is the light pink is before the pandemic, the red is after the pandemic. And we had an increase in uh, mental health symptoms from all the way from mild all the way to severe, which lasted, by the way, through to the first year of COVID. And other conditions, including things like drug overdose. For example, 93,000 people died from drug overdose in 2020. In the first 12 months after COVID started, in March of 2020 to March 2021, 100,000 people died from COVID, which is 30% more uh, died, died from overdose during COVID, 30% more than did uh, the previous year. So a refocus on health means focusing on the conditions that um, um, generate health and a focus on the full range of causes of poor health or of good health. Second thing we need to be doing is a better value informed science. And what's that? What do I mean by that? I mean, we need to be humble in science. We show compassion and think about how we can reform and create a better world slowly, gradually through scientific reason. Um, um, you know, you, we have seen science being arrogant in time of COVID, science being declarative in this positive time and taking them again, particularly as expressed through social media. And this is a quote I really like, which is uh, with a lot at stake, it's wise to be humble when faced with fundamental limitations and science is fundamentally limited. And we we're, we should be humble in a time of COVID-19, say a lot of things that we don't know and recognize that slogans, for example, like follow the science are simply false. The science is only an analytic tool. It's ultimately politics and social conversations that result in determining what it is that we should be doing as a society. In fact, I've written about this in uh, Scientific Americans and what science can and cannot do in a time of pandemic. And we should be much more humble and willing to demonstrate uncertainty. This is from a paper that shows that communicating uncertainty doesn't really affect trust. This should allow us to be more transparent about limits of human knowledge and something that we have not done very well in a time of COVID. 
We also need to have science that's informed by a value of compassion, a compassion for the fact of recognizing that the consequences of COVID were uneven. That um, the um, this is, shows the GDP decline, record decline of GDP, uh, gross domestic product time of the American economy, but the GDP decline was not even. It was a particular group, namely the poorest 50% of population that suffered most. Although there was a change in employment for everybody, for the wealthiest quarter of the population, the change in employment recovered very quickly. It's the bottom 25%. People who work in retail, people who work in construction, people who work in uh, the service industries, those are the people who actually lost jobs during COVID. And I think we should, as a result, transform our science to care for those people. When you look at uh, the um, jobs gained and lost in the time of COVID, what you see is that uh, the third income quartile, lowest income quartile, essentially the poor, the half of the population that makes least money, that's where jobs were lost. For the half of the population where people make more money, jobs were actually gained in the time of COVID. And we need to recognize that different groups have different risks in the time of COVID. Which workers were at risk? Well, it's taxi drivers, bus drivers, firefighters, cleaners, restaurant and kitchen workers. Here's my question to you. How often did you see banners saying, hailing taxi drivers and bus drivers and firefighters and cleaners as heroes? Very little, right? And that's exactly what we should be doing. You know, one of the potentially positive consequences of COVID, and so far as one can have co positive consequences of a pandemic like this, is the uh, transformation of the labor market to potentially raise wages among the groups that um, typically have been left out from the economy. This is actually what happened after the Black uh, Plague in Europe. This is uh, from a, a, um, a um, fresco from the time, and um, it um, what happened is because so many people died, there was a um, real uh, shortage of labor. And as a result, feudal systems where people being held in essentially um, feudal conditions uh, were had much better bargaining power and it opened up the labor market. And I think we're going to see something like that today as well. And part of values is thinking about equity. Equity is the just and fair allocation of resources according to need in a way that preventable differences in health can be minimized. And it's exactly what should be guiding our, um, our science and our politics. And one more value which I'd like to surface is dignity. It's from a piece I wrote about elevating dignity, recognizing that dignity matters, dignity matters to everybody. And we should be very clear that uh, when people are sick, that uh, they should be allowed to see their family members, that uh, we should make sure that um, efforts to contain the spread of an infectious disease does not, do not in any way result in us uh, taking away people's um, dignity to be able to stand tall to each other in the eye and actually have the kind of human interactions that elevates us as a human species. And the third thing I think we need to be doing is the health conversation. I think we need to we need to think carefully about what we talk about when we talk about health and change that in the population. This is from a book that I published uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this is to look at the subtitle, which is under the tree, which says what we need to talk about when we talk about health. That's what this book um, is about. And it is ultimately, I've come, become convinced that it requires a change in the health conversation in order for us to generate better health as a society. And in fact, we know that most people do not recognize that what we need to talk about when we talk about health are these forces that generate health. This is from a survey that uh, we have done in uh, the US and other countries looking at what do you think causes your health? And most people, you see, say healthcare. In fact, it's the smallest group of people who say politics is what causes health. I would actually invert that. I think politics is what most causes health. We have had a significant shift in this country away from recognizing that the causes of health are the building a world around us. This is from a Surgeon General's report, from a Surgeon General's report during President Trump's era. Um, um, and what you see is in the red are public health efforts, things like sanitation, abolition of slavery, libraries, highway system, conservation of parks, social security. These are all efforts that improve the world around us, that improve health. In the purple, you have medicine, antibiotics, DNA, genomics, transplants, etc. In the top bar, you have the relative prominence of these ideas, which you see until, until the 60s, the overall health ideas were more prominent. But then in the after the 60s, the dotted line in purple, you see medical ideas rose to ascendance. And if you look at it, if you go to any library and you look for books about health, um, what you find is books like these that tell the story of heroic creation of health by doctors and nurses and healthcare providers. And all of that is true and all of that is good, but we need to create a vision of health that's value driven, driven towards equity, driven by dignity, and where we train health providers to be the spokespersons for health and to be the people who say that to create a full picture of health, we need to create a world that generates health. So let me um, conclude, and I want to conclude by saying that, uh, you know, I don't think my message, I don't want my message to be negative. I actually think that we can do this by building on past successes. We have had many successes in the past couple of years. I think it's worth recognizing them. You know, for example, we've had clinical success. 
This looks at uh, admission to hospital in the first few months of the pandemic. And all I want you to look at is the blue line. They both behave the same way. It doesn't matter the difference. What you see is that mortality, which is what the blue line show from COVID, a totally new disease in March 2020, was 25%. But by May of 2020, it had already dropped fivefold. That's how good our hospital systems are. They quickly figured out how to deal with a disease. And that's a sign of the fact that we invest a lot of money in our hospital systems. And that investment pays off very well. Similarly, the mRNA technologies that resulted in vaccines, we've been investing in for decades. This is from a paper 10 years ago, and uh, where it says mRNA presents a promising vector that may well become the basis of a game-changing vaccine technology platform. It's exactly what it became, and it's because we invested in it for a long time. So all I'm saying is the things we invest in, our hospitals, our health systems, our technologies, they did very well. It's time for us to invest in the other things that are necessary to make sure that we are protected from the next pandemic. And I want to point out that those other things, we know how to invest in. In fact, the biggest success story of the human species in the past 200 years has been our overall improvement in health, our overall improvement in health. Our health trundled along as life expectancy of about 40, as you see here, until about 1850. And then from 1850 to now, about 150 years, we doubled our life expectancy, something we had never done as a human species. And we did that because we're investing in exactly the things that I'm calling for us to invest in now, showing that we can indeed do this if we set our mind to it. So I'll conclude by saying that, uh, you know, fundamentally, how do we think about health? We think about health by thinking about a focus on health, better value form science, and by changing the health conversation. For anybody who's interested in um, more about this, um, this is my book, Contagion Next Time, that uh, I published in November, that really makes this case much more formally. And uh, hopefully for any of you who are interested in health and interacting with health, you'll find this um, interesting. Um, uh, this is uh, where you can find things about me. And I, I'm really grateful to you for having me here, and I really look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you Thanks so yourself. much, um, Dr. Galea. And I want to open this up time to um, people to ask questions. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Tim, is that possible? Yeah, yes, they should be able to raise hands and also type in the chat, I believe. So as we wait for people to ask questions, I'll get started with one. So you talked about how um, we're, you know, now the CDC has new directives and we've had so many different kinds of communications from the CDC, um, but we can see that there are rising reports about co new COVID infections in Europe and the UK, um, but we've lowered um, the directives here in the US, and that is also happening in other countries. So what are your thoughts about that with all the differences, um, the different communication coming out? Yeah, the, the communication has been very difficult. It's been very difficult communication in time of COVID. And I think it's been difficult in no small part because of our conditions against which communication is happening. We have underinvested in our capacity to have an infrastructure that's ready to communicate. And we have had such fractured politics that um, communication is doesn't exist outside in a vacuum. It actually it cannot be seen in a way that um, is uh, outside of a political and partisan divide. So I think we can get much better at communication. And I think, you know, I'm always heartened by the next generation of students who are coming up who care about communication. But I also think that it requires a tremendous amount of effort for us to actually get better at communication. Awesome. So I see a few people typing. You can um, turn your mics on and maybe ask a question. They won't be able to turn on their mics. Oh, OK. I have to type it in. All right. Mic. I'll read it. Um, Deborah asks, how do we refocus on health equity and away from health care? Yeah, it's. um. I think it's by telling the story. I think it's by you being aware that this will need to do. And I think it's by us consistently being willing to talk about the importance for health equity and talk about how healthcare is important, but it's only one part of the equation. And it's one part of the equation that um, is necessary, but not sufficient to generate health. So I think it's actually by having good people who understand these ideas promoting them and uh, telling the story over and over again, because there's a there's a, a burden, there's a large story on the other side. 
Great. So as people think about more questions, I have a follow up to that almost. Um, you know, when we look at the an equal burden of COVID-19, um, it has shed light on the importance of focusing on the social determinants of health and equity, which is what you really focused on to guide our development and implementation of public health initiatives. So how can health experts, organizations and policymakers make more informed decisions when they allocate funds to address such kind of um, epidemic? Yeah, I, um, I've come to feel that policymakers make decisions informed by the public conversation, that uh, it, is, it is what we, the people, consider to be acceptable that ultimately shapes what uh, policymakers do. And so I think the, the our job is to shape what what is in our cultural acceptance. You know, and there's something called an Overton window. The idea is like this, like there's a window of things that we talk about and one wants to shift the Overton window. And that is, I think, what we can do through telling our story. It's shifting the Overton window so that it becomes something that is clear, that is important that is wanted and uh, and that i think pushes policymakers to make the decisions that are needed to improve health all right um i see people are still typing so when we started vaccinating there was this push towards underserved communities and there was sort of a romanticization of the history, especially with the African American community, and that sort of also flipped that idea of trying to bring them into the fold to encourage um, them to get tested and to also uh, be vaccinated because there was so much of a push of, oh, there's a lot of resistance from that community. How best can we um, be able to communicate, obviously, the challenges and um, the severity of you know, COVID-19, but also not alienate yeah. special communities. Yeah, well, you know, I'm sometimes asked, well, how does one build, um, how does one build trust during the pandemic? And to which my answer is, you don't, you don't build trust during a pandemic, you know, you build trust not during a pandemic so that the communities are willing to trust you when a pandemic hits. Um, in, anybody who's ever read a relationship mending book will uh, know that uh, if you say, trust me, you've lost trust already. And uh, why should, uh, communities that have been marginalized and disenfranchised for decades all of a sudden trust you when you say, well, look, I have a free vaccine that I'm here to give you. Because if people have felt like they're living in communities where their health is getting worse, why would they trust that this is actually something that's in their best interest? So I don't think that, uh, I think our focus is wrong to say, how do we get, um, let's say, minority communities, immigrant communities, to all of a sudden trust the government? I don't think that's doable. I think you can do that only after the pandemic. So I suppose what I'm saying is, now is the time now that there were maybe done the pandemic or at least in a lull the pandemic to build the trust and that's a long-term project indeed so there's another question what are the characteristics of a powerful persuasive story for policymakers? <laughs> um, um you know i um i don't consider to me myself to be a uh, in any way a uh, an elite storyteller i uh i, I I hope there are people in the audience who are better storytellers than I am. I think uh, we know that uh, stories about people are compelling. We know that uh, stories that uh, illustrate the what happens in population are compelling. And uh, I, I, I see my job as encouraging as many storytellers as possible because there are a lot of storytellers who tell the story of med of uh, medicine, but there are f far fewer storytellers that tell the story of health. Awesome. So now that. The directives have changed. People were fatigued by all the anxiety from COVID-19. What advice would you give us, you know, to continue presenting the information, continue rallying people to action? How can we do this? How do we do this, basically? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how do we do this? You know, I, I I don't want to be trite about it, but I think we do this by having this conversation. I um, I'm delighted you're having this conversation. Delighted you're hosting this conversation. I'm I'm uh, grateful to all of you who are here, who are part of this conversation. I think um, that's how one does it. I think one does it by keeping this conversation at the forefront and by writing papers, writing books, talking about it, by training students who see this as an important issue. <laughs> 
as I wait for more people, I have one more question. Um, <clears throat> there's the issue of long COVID um, and the implications on health outcomes um, and life expectancy. Uh, what, what would you say about that and how should people look at that? Yeah, I mean, the, the data on long COVID remains, um, the verdict's still out, but um, there's no question there's long COVID. It'll last in a certain percent of the population, maybe 10% of the population, we'll see. And I think it becomes a um, an issue of concern. The data are still emerging, but almost certainly long COVID is going to affect um, uh, people who are uh, marginalized with low income even more than uh, other people. So I think it's one more opportunity and one more imperative for us to invest in and protect those populations. Awesome. So I'll take this time to invite our Dean, um, Dr. John McCarthy, to say something uh, before we end the meeting. Probably he's not able to turn his camera on. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I was, just, it took a moment. Um, Dr. Liga, thank you so much for um, this presentation. And I completely agree. I think this is one of many conversations that needs to continue happening. Um, and that uh, it it's the not talking about it that's causing harm, or it's the uh, only one side um, talking about it causing harm too. So um, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, really express my gratitude and uh, say thanks uh, for how much I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Anyone else has a burning question? So Dr. Galea, you can go ahead and um, give some final remarks and then we'll um, end the meeting. Yeah, no, uh, my only remark is thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you, Dr. Gingori, for inviting me. And uh, the uh, I, I do, I'm firmly believe that this is how conversations change is by having these kind of conversations. I think that's the, that's the place of uh, the academic world. And uh, uh, I'm grateful to you all for engaging with, um, uh, with this conversation. And thank you to, to all of you for taking these ideas forward. And we also want to echo Dean McCarthy's um, expressions of thanking you for your time um, and being able to provide us such a comprehensive perspective of what has been and what we can do with regard to um, moving the conversation forward for COVID-19. And I want to thank everyone who was able to join. It seems there are some folks who were not able to join us today. We had a whole